So again, welcome to uh, fourth module for machine learning. Um, this is under the Creative Commons license, so share and share alike. And the focus um, for uh, this module is on the use of neural networks for secondary structure prediction. Uh, again, this is the schedule. We've got about an hour. Uh, I'll have to go through this fairly quickly because um, uh, we have a lot of material and uh, apologies if I seem like I'm speeding, but there's a lot. So I'll briefly talk about secondary structure. If people have never heard of it, I'll try and explain it. Um, and then I'll, I'll show you how neural networks can be used to handle and interpret sequence data. So the, the key thing here is um, we're, we're looking at uh, sequences and a lot of what you have to do with machine learning is, and especially with neural nets, is to figure out how to recode or encode your data uh, so that it's more compatible with the neural net input. And uh, some of it's thinking about it in a novel way or restructuring it or reformatting it. Um, so this is, I think, maybe the main take home lesson for this particular module. We'll go through a neural network for predicting secondary structure called an SSANN. And then um, basically we won't have enough time for uh, the lab. So the lab will essentially be uh, sort of homework for people to do after the, the class is over today. So we're talking about secondary structure that relates to proteins and that relates to polypeptides. So polypeptides are made up of amino acids, strings of amino acids that are strung together. They're sort of like chains or chain links. Um, they can pivot around each other through certain torsion angles. Um, for proteins, it consists of longer stretches of, of amino acids, generally more than 40 amino acids. The sequence uh, of amino acids in a protein is called the primary structure. The formation of coils or spring-like structures or linear strands, those are uh, secondary structures. The three-dimensional structure of a protein as it folds into collections of beta strands is called the tertiary structure. Um, and then how proteins complex with each other form aggregates, that's called the quaternary structure. Um, these are just some pictures, schematic diagrams of a beta sheet. This is the anti-parallel beta sheet. Also on the left, you can see four anti-parallel, well, I guess two sets of anti-parallel beta strands and one parallel beta strand. Um, beta strands are generally extended. They have hydrogen bonding between uh, amide and carbonyl residues um, or um, groups. And beta strands tend to sort of form the, the central core or hydrophobic core of, of, of proteins. Helices are probably more familiar to people. They look like springs. Um, they have, a, again, a characteristic hydrogen bonding between the first and the fourth residue uh, in increments all the way up. Uh, they're very stable structures. So these represent the, the main building blocks of secondary structure. Those secondary structures, the red and helices, yellow and beta strands, can be assembled into a three-dimensional structure. These are called ribbon diagrams. Um, some proteins are all helical, some proteins are mostly beta sheet, others are, are more mixed. Um, the structure of proteins is something that um, many people have been studying for a long, long time. Uh, when the first structures emerged in the 1960s, um, people immediately noticed there is this periodicity in helices and beta strands. And people started noticing a relationship between sequence and secondary structure. So uh, very early on, people actually tried to predict protein secondary structure from, from sequence. And this was an effort to try and predict protein structure. Um, they found that certain amino acids seem to prefer certain secondary structure elements, alpha, uh, alanine and uh, methionine, um, leucine and glutamate tended to be in helices, isoleucine, valine, uh, threonine tended to be in beta strands. It's been a subject um, that's been published about and written about for probably more than 40, 45 years. It's, it's sort of fading from um, being in vogue, partly because most proteins structures have been largely solved by now. But it's, I think, a nice example um, because it's an application of um, machine learning to do something that was intrinsically very hard to do. Uh, understanding secondary structure helps us understand 
three-dimensional structures. It helps with things like uh, threading and remote sequence similarity detection. Uh, people also are using it to understand protein function. So as most of you might gather, I'm, I'm uh, pretty old. And in fact, I've been involved in protein secondary structure prediction for the last 30 years. It's the reason actually why I got into bioinformatics. And so again, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm using this as a good example. Um, so this is uh, an example of where we've got a string of amino acids, a sequence uh, that's written at the top of this um, particular view. And then what's marked in yellow and blue or cyan um, are examples of secondary structures that have been predicted. Um, so you can see uh, one helix rest stretching from about residue one to residue 14, another helix stretching from about residue 33 to residue 45, and a beta strand from residue, I don't know, 22 to 28. And there are different predictors. Um, one is what's called the chu fassman model, another one is a Garnier model, one uses hydrophobic moments, another one looks for motifs. Uh, and then you can come up with a consensus that combines these together. So this is an example of secondary structure prediction that's not using necessarily machine learning, but in this case, using sort of statistical propensities. And some of these statistical propensities are identified back in the 60s um, by Jerry Fassman and his student um, Chu, and they published this, uh, I guess, table about 1969. And it just shows that certain amino acids like alanine A has a high helical propensity, 1.42. Um, you can see that uh, proline P has a very high coil propensity, a 1.88. So the PC is coil probability, P beta is beta sheet probability, P alpha is the helix. So different amino acids have different preferences or probabilities uh, for being in certain secondary structures. Mm -hmm. And so using these tables of numbers, um, you can kind of come up with a simple mathematical one. This is not machine learning, but it's a mathematical one where you say, take a stretch of amino acids, seven uh, amino acids, calculate the numbers uh, for helix, beta sheet, and coil, uh, determine the average, assign the, the middle residue, number res residue number four to that, that value. So you can do this for each of the alphas, the betas, and the coils. And then you can slide this window of seven residues through the entire length of the protein sequence. And then you can generate a plot, which is essentially the helical beta sheet and coil propensity. So here's a, res a protein that's got maybe 61 or 62 residues. And we can see the plot with the green, there's a beta sheet at the beginning because that's the highest value. Then we can see a blue, that's the helix. And then we can see a red that starts around 18 and goes to about residue. I know 37, that's a coil region. Then there's another beta sheet, then there's another helix, and then there's another coil. And so this is just simply a plot and then you use a sort of a threshold to say, if it's above this, it's helix. If it's <clears throat> above that, it's a coil, which would, whichever value is highest, that's the winner. So that, that's, that's an example of a heuristic method, one that can be calculated with a conventional computer, uh, even with an Excel spreadsheet to predict uh, secondary structure. Now, the chu fassman method is really old, um, 50 years old at least. Um, and it doesn't take into account really long range information, doesn't take into the fact that some proteins have a preference for being in a structural class. Uh, it assumes secondary structure uh, probabilities are additive. It doesn't look for certain patterns of amino acids that are known, they're known to be helical caps and they're known to be helical ends. And so with all those limitations, the method is only about 50% accurate. And a random method would be about 33% accurate. So it, it's, you know, it's better than random, but it's not great. Um, secondary structure um, prediction took a, a giant leap forward in the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s, when people started using neural networks. And uh, a program called PHD um, was developed. And um, this one basically took sequences. Um, it used um, sort of some sequence alignment or sequence profiles ran it through a fairly simple neural network and predicted secondary structure. And its performance went from, you know, 
at the time, the standard was around 50, 55%, up to around 65 or 70% accurate. And that was, that was massive. And that's what actually got me interested in neural nets and machine learning. The way that secondary structure is evaluated is sort of like a, a multiple choice exam, where if you had answers A, B, and C, and you count the number of correct answers from A's and B's and C's. So in secondary structure, we have um, B for beta sheet, C for coil, and H for helix. Um, and so you can have essentially a confusion matrix compare between the predicted and observed values. Um, so you can have, in this case, the diagonals, the beta sheet was predicted 77% of the time, coil 81% of the time, helix 88% of the time correctly. Um, and then we can compare where that's over predicted or under predicted in terms of true positives and false positives. The result the combining of the beta sheet, coil, and helix prediction is called a Q3 score. And then what I'm showing is another method, which is called the confusion matrix. So the idea of using artificial neural nets to predict secondary structure and identify patterns of residues is getting on to be about uh, 25 years old now. Um, We've talked about neural nets already, so I won't belabor the point, just saying that they are ways of performing both classification and regression. For secondary structure prediction, um, what you're trying to do is take your sequence data, and you might have many examples of sequences. Um, so we've got A, C's, G's, and A. Um, this is, could be DNA, it could be protein, whatever. In this case, it's protein. We're passing it as an input uh, or through an input layer. We have a hidden layer. Uh, we have an output. And the output here is secondary structures. In this case, these sequences predict um, to be mostly beta sheet. Um, the net the connections between those nodes are the weight matrices. And just as we learned before, um, it's trying to modify those weight matrices that allows us to make the predictions. Um, we think about encoding. Uh, so we have a sequence um, and we might uh, one hot encode A's, C's and G's just like we did with um, flowers like 001, 010. And if we only had an alphabet of, of three letters, um, we could encode it this, this way. We can also think of having a sliding window where maybe we're taking three or seven residues at a time. So we then concatenate those those three uh, amino acids um, together uh, to produce an input vector, which is three times three or nine uh, elements long. Um, we might have another output where we indicate that secondary structure is um, coded through B, C, and H. And we might have a decision of what the, the central residue should be in terms of the desired output, uh, whether it's in this case a coil. So the CGA, uh, the central residue G probably is indicated to be, let's say, a coil or something like that. Um, so there's a, a, a formatting where we're modifying um, how we encode, how we do one hot encoding. Um, and this is critical to actually having a successful neural net. Uh, if you don't do the proper kind of encoding, and sometimes you need to be creative or um, inventive, uh, then your neural net may not work out as well as you want. Um, I think we've shown this sort of same structure before where we have a, a, a vector or a set of numbers that encodes the sequence. We have a weight matrix. In this case, the weight matrix has to be of the same um, number of rows as the length as the input vector. This is just general linear algebra. Um, so we take a seven, or two, four, six, eight, a nine by one matrix, multiply it by a nine by three matrix, which gives us um, a three by one matrix. And we multiply a three by one matrix by a three by two, and that gives us a two by one matrix. And that gives us, let's say, our desired output. We compare um, you know, what our initial feed forward calculation is. So we get 0 0.24, 0 0.74. We compare it with the preferred or desired output, in this case, say a zero one. Um, and we can see we're slightly off. So we have to do some back propagation to adjust those numbers. Uh, then we re recalculate 
same kind of input vector, we find that uh, we've changed things. The, it's dropped a little better and the first digit and the last um, numbers increased. So it's a little closer to zero one. And so after a few rounds of training, we think it's converged. Um, and we can carry on. Uh, we can put in a new input. We can modify and compare and iterate. And just as I showed before, after many iterations, we create, uh, in this case, two generalized weight matrices, which maybe allow us to predict secondary structure with, say, high accuracy. So that's the concept behind using neural nets for taking sequence and um, predicting an output. So that could be secondary structure, it could be binding, it could be the location of a, a promoter, it could be a gene. Um, so all kinds of things can be done uh, through neural nets or through hidden Markov models where we're taking sequence data and converting it. So we're gonna try a, a real example. And this is one where we're gonna try and predict secondary structure from protein sequence data. Uh, that's our problem. And then now we're gonna construct our data set. So we're gonna take a data set that uh, we compiled many years ago called the Protein Property Prediction and Testing Database. Uh, it's a website where we have uh, sequence information uh, and the secondary structure for thousands of proteins. Um, so you can see the amino acid sequence um, is using the standard one letter code. Secondary structure uses C's for coils, B's for beta sheet, and H for helices. Um, so you can take that data, download it, and it um, has all the information about the protein name, the sequence, um, the secondary structure. Uh, and so you've got, you know, in this case, hundreds if not thousands of examples. So that's our data set. Um, it's still considered a gold standard. It uses some um, fairly sophisticated uh, computational methods to identify the secondary structure. Again, it's not machine learning. It's, it's calculating certain features and summing them together, but it's a robust, useful data set. So um, we're gonna try using the neural net and this training set to see if we can predict secondary structure. So as before, um, we could, you know, pretend to code, but in this case, all we're going to do is open up the module for Python code. Um, again, it's also been written in R. Um, and then you can open up uh, the secondary structure, uh, SSAN, and, and work with Google Collaboratory. So it's very similar in design to the um, IRIS neural net program. We have to read data check for missing data, check for invalid amino acids, split things in the training and test set. Then we have to do some encoding. We have to convert the amino acids um, to uh, some sort of numeric alphabet. We have to convert the secondary structure to some kind of numeric uh, uh, encoding. So this is where we do the sort of one-hot encoding. Um, because we're running Windows of uh, about I think it's 21 amino acids. We have to make sure uh, that we have, I guess, padded uh, sequences at the beginning and at the end, because you want to be able to have your window run uh, to the end and not start uh, 10 or 11 residues into the sequence. Um, so we put extra fake amino acids at the beginning and at the end so that our window can slide through. So we introduce what are called null amino acids. Um, so we've, we encode the amino acids, we encode the secondary structure, uh, we define some functions for those, um, AA encode, SST encode. We also have to define our activation function, just like we did before, a sigmoidal or and softmax functions. And just like we did before, we initialize weights and biases, we determine the batches, that we do forward propagation, error calculation, back propagation, update, and then iterate over many hundreds of epochs. Um, for this one, we'll import NumPy and Pandas, just as we've done before for most of our other programs. Um, then we have to read our data. So this is still in a CSV format. Um, it, the reading is a little different. Uh, it's not the same as the iris data anymore. Um, but this is what the data looks like in terms of both the sequence and the secondary structure. Uh, so we can parse that out. Uh, we can also modify this a little bit to look for um, uh, 
or ensure that we have um, standard amino acids, um, whether they have the right letters, if there's any X's in particular, um, and make sure that those are either cleared up or identified and sorted out. Uh, we're also going to check for any missing values. Um, and again, this is just a standard thing to make sure that we don't have any missing sequences or missing secondary structure elements. If we do, it flags that. So again, this is very standard. Um, we're using a training data set, a training and testing data set of about 1,400 proteins. Um, there's more than 100,000 in the protein data bank, but this is just to keep things reasonable. Um, the, um, in this case, uh, we've set out our, our data size. Um, there's a, a data fraction and then a training fraction of 70% and then 30%. So we're gonna still split it out um, so that we have a, a reasonable set. So this is um, you know, just sort of de rigueur um, setup where we're just reading our data, setting up our training and testing set, um, working with a data size just to make sure we don't um, flood the computer and have to wait hours. Um, key two neural nets, and we emphasized this before with the iris one, they have to do the same thing with sequence data, is encoding, uh, one hot encoding, so the input can be manipulated using matrix calculations, using dot products and vector products. So we need to be able to change our amino acids from A and C and D, which are single last letter characters to, uh, a, an, we'll call this amino acid binary. So um, in this case, there's 20 um, or 21 locations because there's 20 amino acids. And then we've introduced a special amino acid called the null amino acid. And this is sort of the invisible amino acid that we put at the beginning at the end of the sequence. And this is typically done whenever you're having to do some kind of windowing function where you're spanning through sequences. Um, because your window function kind of runs off the front and runs off the end. We can also one hot encode the secondary structure. Uh, we're setting the B to be 100, C to be 010, H to be 001. Same sort of thing that we did with Satosa, Vir Virginica, and, and um, um, whatever the other one, Versicolor. Um, so uh, we have to make sure uh, we convert our first of our amino acids into a sort of a binary number uh, for each amino acid. And so this is what we're doing in sort of the encoding. Um, so that we've got these 21 letters uh, for the 21 amino acids, standard 20 plus the null amino acid. Uh, the secondary structures are also going to convert that to B, C, and H and great numbers that are going to be 0, 1. 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. We have a windowing function, as I said. This is another thing where you use intuition um, so that when you're trying to build out or cre create some kind of um, predictor, um, you take what you know. You take what perhaps has worked for other people. And certainly in the case of secondary structure, people know that when you collect from data with nearest neighbors, it helps with the quality of the secondary structure prediction. So we're trying to arrive, you know, capture these pairwise or distant interactions. And so we group them into windows. And we're going to try and calculate the secondary structure for the residue at the center of these windows. So um, first part, as I said, this is padding, um, where we've got a, a protein that begins with proline, ends with proline. Uh, and then we're putting um, these null amino acids at the beginning and at the end so that we can still allow our window to uh, start and pass through the entire um, sequence for the protein. Um, what we're doing is we're taking sequence and then this is this window um, and then we're predicting the secondary structure for the central residue in that window. So we've got this window of about 10 residues or 11, I guess. The central residue is glutamate, that's the E, and it is predicted to be a helix um, in that center, in that central residue. Uh, we can then slide our window along by one residue. So we've moved from E to P, and then we'll take the prediction 
uh, and that also is predicted to be um, helix. So we can just slide this along the length of the entire sequence. So here we're encoding this sequence. Um, the sequence starts with, in this case, with isoleucine, glutamate, 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 leucine, leucine. We've padded it with a bunch of null characters. These are null amino acids, and we're encoding them as 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way to 1. Uh, isoleucine has the encoding of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Uh, glutamine has a, an encoding where there's about, I don't know, 15 ones or zeros and then a one. So this is how we are encoding. Um, now, the other thing that we're doing is we're taking all these sort of binary readouts um, that uh, have 21 um, zeros or ones, that's for each amino acid, and we're taking a window of 17 which means it'll be the ninth residue, which is the middle residue of the window from 17, uh, is being predicted. Um, so we've, I've drawn a box of covering 17 amino acids at the very beginning. Uh, I have eight null residues. The ninth residue is the first residue. And instead of creating a, a table that's 17 by 21, which is 17 amino acids and 21 um, binary values for amino acids. I'm going to flatten this. I'm going to take uh, the 17 by 21, which is 357, and make it into a single vector of 357 bits. So this is another trick that's used a lot in neural networks for sequence data. So this is what the flattening looks like. So I've taken all of those 00001s and from all of those sequences, and I've just moved them all up into one very, very, very long 357-bit um, vector. Um, and so when I'm doing the calculations, I, um, I've got my window of, of 17. I move it down by one. And so I've moved from isoleucine to glutamate, glutamate, which is a new center. And this is now residue two. Um, and then I you know, convert things, flatten things, and, and carry on. So I do this for the entire length of the protein. So the protein's 300 residues long, and I'm going to have a lot of these really long vectors, 357, um, shown 300 times. Uh, and so uh, we go this all the way to the very end, and this is the last residue, the tyrosine, uh, and then I padded it with another eight null amino acids. So here's the whole length of the protein, let's say it's 350 residues, and I now have 357 bits for each of the uh, uh, proteins or each of the amino acids, which corresponds to information about the surrounding sequence. So I also encode uh, not only the amino acid data, which is on the left, on the right I'm encoding the output data. So each amino acid has a secondary structure. And so I fill that in as well and recall the encoding that we use for secondary structures of 0, 100 for helix, 010 for beta sheet, and 001 for coil, I guess. So um, I'm, I've just shown in slides what essentially we're encoding here. We're, we're producing this AA encode. Uh, so it creates this window size. We, we create first a set of null. We pad it based on the size of the window. So um, how, how many columns we're going to have, um, how many residues, the length, and how we bitize everything. Um, we also make sure that we've encoded it, um, concatenate those padding sequences to uh, the beginning at the end. Um, and then now that we've encoded the padded protein sequence, then we start flattening it. So we convert this to this 357-bit um, representation of the 17 amino acids and the 21 amino acid calls. Um, we then take uh, the secondary structure, which again I was showing previously, but this is how we've encoded it. Um, so this is a function called SST3 encode, so the secondary structure encoding. Uh, and we have um, uh, H, C, and B, three different types, and then we're going to encode that um, all the way through to the protein, the whole length, and then also convert that to zeros and ones as needed. 
So now that we've encoded, um, and unlike say the uh, iris data, where we had to worry about you know, numeric data regarding the length and width, we, we don't have numeric data. We have basically zeros and ones. So we don't have to do any more normalization. We don't have to do L1 normalization or L2 normalization. Um, the data is pretty randomized. Um, it's ranging between zero and one. Um, so we, we get to avoid the normalization process. Um, so here's what our model architecture looks like. Um, we've got uh, 357 inputs. Uh, I'm not going to show 357 in the diagram. And we have three outputs. Um, and uh, we have a hidden layer uh, with the hidden layer size being somewhat variable depending on what we want for our architecture. Just like we did for the iris data, uh, iris problem, uh, we have to choose a, an activation function. So we're using the sigmoid function and the sigmoid derivative function, which works really well. Um, again, this is just some mass reminders about the sigmoid function, also about the softmax function, uh, which is used for layer two. So again, this is the definition of the softmax function. Uh, we went through this last time, so I'm not going to repeat it, but this is, uh, again, just setting things up so that we can use our appropriate activation functions for each of the layers. Just as before, we have to initialize our weights and biases, so we call up some random numbers and create those random weights all the way through, um, both for W0, W1, and BH, and B0. Uh, we're going to calculate the number of batches. Um, so we've got you know, 1,400 proteins, I guess, and we have to choose how many batches we're going to train. And so that's partly decided by the user, uh, but we have to make sure that the batch sizes are come up to whole numbers. Um, the training loop is exactly the same. Um, this idea of looking at these different batches, do the forward propagation, error determination, back propagation, update the weights and biases. We do this for batch one, two, three to batch n. Once we've completed that, then we, we've completed one epoch and then we repeat for hundreds of epochs um, to make sure the training is, is thorough and complete. Um, again, this is very similar to the, the slides we saw. And in many respects, this is just recycling a lot of the same architecture. We have to worry about the learning rate and batch size. Um, we want outputs which return the, tr the trained weights, the biases, and the error measurements. The forward propagation um, is largely the same. Uh, again, it's now we're dealing with sort of a window size and the number of amino acids. Um, and the hidden layer size, and we have the dot product, and we're calculating the activation function with layer one using a sigmoidal function, and the second layer using the softmax function. Um, just as before, we have to determine the error once we've done the forward propagation. This is the difference between the output and the observed or known output, so the predicted versus observed. And then we, we change or propagate that delta all the way through to the other uh, layers. Um, the back propagation goes from layer two to layer one, layer one to layer zero. Uh, again, these are the same methods, models, approaches um, in terms of both the weighting and the bias um, that we talked about the last time. So I'm not going to go into a, a whole lot of detail. Um, the back propagation, uh, as I say, still continues through the different layers. Uh, we're looking at the, the sigmoid derivative, we're looking at um, cost um, and that function, which is marked in red um, and highlighted to those, to those points. So this is, again, very much similar to what we did um, before. The back propagation continues uh, all the way from two to one to zero, um, again with um, the deltas um, for both the uh, weight and the bias. And now we're looking uh, from layer one to layer zero. After we've uh, completed the back propagation step, we're updating all of the weights. Um, 
And we're multiplying this by our learning rate, LR, um, which is the Greek letter eta, and um, the delta that's um, uh, learning weight delta that's marked here. So we have a different um, um, layers marked and different weights marked. So the weights are updated, the biases are updated, uh, a similar kind of uh, formula, same slides, basically the same interpretation that we used uh, for the iris model. So once you've done one neural network, you've kind of done them all. There's, there's you know, subtle changes to format, but the um, backpropagation steps, um, the activation steps, the bias and weighting adjustments, um, they're all pretty much the same. Um, this is the same coding that you saw with the iris model. Um, it's taking a batch, doing forward propagation, uh, calculating errors, calculating the derivatives, doing um, uh, the back propagation, then the weight and bias updating, and repeating that over and over and over again for each ep epoch. So this is a little different. So this is an animation of what's happening with the different um, input layers. So the 17 input layers uh, we're seeing um, across the, the graph is the, the 17. And they're sort of concatenated or condensed so that instead of seeing 357, we're only seeing um, 17 units. Um, you can see um, their weighting or the numbers that are sort of the average over these things. Um, we have um, input units. So we're seeing the epochs being changed. We're going from the first epoch to 170, 180, 190. Um, we also have the output units um, and what their value is. So as we're training, you can see numbers are changing. Some initially change quite quickly, but as we get towards the end of, um, I don't know, I think it's about a thousand epochs, um, the numbers are only changing subtly. They're you know, 0.1 here, minus 0.1 or 0.01. Uh, so it's starting to settle. So you can see how the, the colors change as you went from the beginning to the end and, and back again. So there's quite a bit of change that happens at the beginning, first 200, and then it settles quite nicely uh, around the last um, 100 or so of the 1,000 epochs that it's, it runs through. Um, so, this is just sort of showing um, sort of the specific weights. Uh, we've got um, 17, I guess, in, il illustrated as the inputs coming in. We've got um, within the single hidden layer, we've got these five hidden units, and then we've got three output units. So it's kind of a, a pseudo 17, 5, and 3, although it's uh, 357, 5, and 3 is, is the real um, input. That, uh, we just can't show 357. Um, and so this is just showing uh, the weightings and, and the various connections based on where they are, the numbers, and the strength of the weightings sort of in terms of the, the lines. Um, we could show darker or thicker blue lines and thinner blue lines based on their, their overall weights. Um, and probably I should recolor them so that we have the appropriate colored weights. But the light, light green would be um, lower weights, the dark blue or black, um, heavier weights in, in this diagram. So in addition to um, the weights changing and eventually converging, uh, the error also is converging. And the error plot is pretty generic. Um, over the number of epochs we trained for a thousand, error drops quite significantly by a uh, factor of probably 40 or more um, in terms of what we see. And, and so that's telling us that as it settles out, we're, we're getting good convergence and that the um, program is, is performing well. So uh, we have two versions of uh, the secondary structure ANN, one written in Python, the other one written in R. 
um, the one in Python uses NumPy and Pandas, um, you can see that the Python one is much more compact in terms of the number of lines of code. Uh, they run about the same. As a general rule, our programs run a little slower. Um, and once we've essentially um, assembled the program, trained it on our um, training set, then we can start testing it uh, on, the, on, the, on the test data, technically. And this is essentially um, how we do the, the testing uh, forward propagation. So what we've got is a training set uh, in this case, it was 497 sequences uh, and a test set of 213. So a grand total of, I guess, 710. So we used about 10% of the entire uh, data set, uh, which had 7,100 sequences in it. Um, so we kept this small just so that the program could perform in your lifetime. Uh, just given how slow um, some of the collab code can be. So what we've done here is we've calculated the Q3 score um, for the training, uh, and we've assessed it on the number of amino acids. And um, what you can see is a diagonal. So we've got the confusion matrix. And so it predicts beta sheet 48% of the time correctly, coil 69% of the time correctly, Helix uh, 63%. That's on the training set. The testing set, which is you know, about one third the size, um, the performance is 46, 69, 65. Um, it's not a perfect prediction. It's not like what we saw with um, the um, IRIS data set where um, the errors were mostly zero or 0 0.05. Um, the iris data set is almost a trivial one. Um, secondary structure prediction is non-trivial. Um, so this is more typical of what you'll see in, a, I guess we'll call it a, a difficult um, prediction program or prediction challenge. Um, so you have you know, larger off-diagonal elements uh, and the diagonal elements are not 1.00 or 0.99. Uh, they're hovering around 65%. Overall, the Q3 score, which is sort of what you would get on a three um, question multiple choice test, or there's three answers in each question, is 61%. And so uh, both the training and testing are consistent in terms of the numbers. So we can say this is not overtrained. So we're confident in terms of its performance. So essentially what we have is, is a neural network program written in pure Python, also one written in R. Uh, we've trained it on fairly large data sets. Uh, the, it took a fair bit of time for us to find the right training size set. So the first time we did it is too large, second time it was too small. So we're not showing you all the challenges we faced in terms of you know, choosing a, a good training set size. But in principle, this could be used uh, not only for secondary structure prediction, but you could use it to predict um, membrane spanning regions. You could predict um, signal site prediction. The same concept could even be applied to DNA for gene prediction. And in fact, we'll show you how to do this. So similar ideas, um, just with the way that we've encoded sequence data, the way that we map sequence to some output uh, information that it's a, a concept that can be reused in many, many uh, formats. Um, what you can do with this, uh, obviously, is, is actually play around with it. And I think what I wanted to do, because of, I think, the time, uh, was sort of give people the opportunity to work in the lab, either with homework, because um, I know it's the end of the day for many people, or if those of you who are ambitious, um, you could just follow the slides along where it's the same sort of thing. You go to module four, uh, download SSNN or SAN as we call it. You can also take the R code if you prefer that over the Python code. As before, sort of just look at the, the code uh, as I've illustrated uh, and explained. We have a data set. This is called converted data. So it's a much larger data set than what we have in the iris. Um, and as before, you can run the program. Um, 
So it'll take a while to execute um, and you can change things um, and uh, uh, make adjustments to and assess the performance in terms of helix and coil and beta sheet prediction, uh, adjust your uh, data fraction, adjust your training fraction. Um, there are some other variations you can do and change your learning rate. Um, you can plot your error plot, see how it performs. Um, you can upload different sequences and see how they predict. Um, so any number of things that you could do with this uh, in terms of testing it out, trying it out. Uh, and given that we still have a few minutes left, um, I'd certainly encourage people to, to give it a try.